So I'm going to talk about, um, is there a way to, to get less echo? I'm going to talk about some of my, that's really, it's really difficult to talk with so much echo. <laughs> I'm going to talk about some are based on When I was discussing last year um, at one of my certified Scrum Master classes in, in Budapest and talking with the participants um, what they would like to hear and uh, they, they suggested that uh, this, this would be an interesting topic. So, but nevertheless, I take the blame. <laughs> um, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Simon Roberts. I'm, uh, I have a, a company in, based in Germany, um, based in Berlin. Um, Scrum Center, I'm a management consultant, agile coach, and a certified Scrum trainer. Um, <clears throat> I've been involved in agile and light, light, lightweight methods since before we, before agile was, so that the word agile was really discovered uh, or, in, or invented for this. Um, so when we talked about lightweight methods, so since the light, 1990s. Last year, I, um, had the pleasure of being here and talked about some of the work I've been doing together with Steve Denning on radical management. And just as a reminder, um, radical management, it's, a, it's five shifts um, from traditional management to a new way of management um, for the 21st century, a more effective um, approach to help every, sort of to help maximize the, the creativity in organizations. And the first shift is, is based is um, moving from stakeholder value to customer delight as the as the overriding strategy behind the company. Um, really inspired by Peter Drucker and his idea that that the the purpose of a firm is to create customers. The second shift is from um, managers being controllers to being enablers of self-organisation. The basis behind our ideas in radical management is that, is that self-organization is, is fundamentally better for the, the vast majority of work that takes place in, in um, when many organizations, certainly any organizations that are doing knowledge-based work. The third shift is, base, is, is that the structure um, the structure of a company needs to change from, from what we call dynamic linking, so basically doing agile, to um, bringing the producers and consumers of business value together and, and doing iteration, so, so doing or being agile effectively. The fourth shift is a, is a shift from a, a focus on, on economic value to values that are aligned in terms of um, what we do what we say we do in the company, what we value, what's on the website, and also what the, <clears throat> what the organization really does internally. And the fifth shift is a, is a shift from um, 
communication through commands to communication through conversation. Now today, I want to focus on the second of those principles and look at, well, what does create, if managers have as part of their, part of their, or one of the most important parts of their job, um, creating, creating an environment in which self-organizing uh, self teams can flourish, what does that actually mean? So let's look at some of the factors behind high performance, or the key factors for high performance teams. That's a picture of Berlin, where I, where I live. Um, there's a lot of high performance teams in Berlin. Berlin is this, more or less the startup capital of the world these days. And uh, some of them, at least, actually take notice of uh, some of these factors. So um, the first one, trust. <clears throat> Somebody that um, influenced my, 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 my thinking about trust was, of course, um, Linda. So thank you very much for your... I remember um, attending a, a workshop uh, years and years ago on trust at, at Allianz in Germany that you, you gave and really helped, helped me to understand, I think a lot of people to understand, that if teams don't, don't have trust with, between the team members, then it's really, really difficult to, uh, to make progress. So trust is a fundamental a fundamental factor for high performance teams. Um, having stable teams, teams that sit together, maybe that's a contentious topic, so many organizations are, are choosing to outsource these days, but it does have a dramatic impact in my experience on the quality of the results. And uh, as this, you know, I think uh, it, it's an optional, it is, it is optional to, to outsource, it's not actually you can produce great results by also by not outsourcing, in fact, better results. And of course, high performance teams are self-organized. They're also cross-functional, so all necessary skills are present, and they tend to spread the knowledge between the team members. So cross-functional doesn't mean, there's a common myth, cross-functional doesn't mean that everybody can do everything so for example for scrum teams it's not necessary to when you're starting that everybody is able to do everything but over time we definitely want to um, blur the specializations a little bit that doesn't mean that people should um, be able to do everything it doesn't mean that they should be just a generalist they definitely need to retain their specializations <clears throat> crucial is also um, diversity of cognitive approach. I think that's something that many organizations, organizations don't take enough account of. More later on that. And of course, intrinsic motivation, as popularized by Dan Pink, uh, what he calls it, um, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. More later on that is it, really important. And also the concept of, of flow, and uh, we'll come later to all of these topics. So first of all, trust. <clears throat> um, I was recently at a company um, doing some internal training. And what was really in interesting when, when we had the, the kickoff for the company, the kickoff for the training, was that um, everybody was saying, we've got a fundamental problem. And, that problem is we know each other very well and we don't trust each other. And in many, many ways, they were it's a very inspiring company, but this, this absence of trust is really um, damaging their ability to make progress. And <clears throat> one thing that I've noticed is that there, 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 it, there tends to be, in some companies and in some cultures perhaps, um, a barrier to achieving additional, uh, sort of achieving trust. What my observation is that if we if we don't know personal details about each other, if um, it's very difficult to achieve trust, we need to we need to actually tell stories about about our private life. Um, I think as as animals we evolved living and working together, and we're sort of hardwired to um, <clears throat> to actually know 
personal details about each other. And if we don't have that, if we don't have that, that information, if we don't have that context, it's very difficult to achieve trust. <clears throat> Some of the things that, um, for example, at Deutsche Telekom, where I've spent a lot of time over the last few years um, helping them with their agile transition, something that we've done a lot are very simple things like, like pub quizzes. So scrum masters or other leaders will organize um, an after work, will organize a, um, going to the pub together, having a quiz, something that's you know, very familiar for, for, the, for people from the UK. I don't know if, if that's something that happens in Hungary, but some sort of social event. What doesn't seem to be quite so helpful are the sort of macho team building events, climbing and things like that. But what seems to be crucial is, is, is actually socializing together, um, learning about the, the private lives of each other, um, of each other's private lives. And some people, of course, will say, well, what happens in, in the work environment, that's, that's the team's business, but what happens in my private life is, is my business. I think if, unless we're prepared to actually challenge that, um, there can be an, a barrier to, to teams becoming <clears throat> better. So moving on to stable, self-organizing teams. <clears throat> the key thing here is stability. There's, I think in most people, people need to belong to a team, want to belong to something. That doesn't mean that they have to be, have to be a, it has to be a life sentence in a, in a, in a, in a team. Um, some sort of healthy rotation for, for job enrichment is of course desirable. But in many organizations, there's a, a dogma of creating teams for projects or for task forces, and then when the project or the emergency is, is over, the team gets disbanded and sent back to the matrix or the pool or whatever you like to call it. And that's a huge, that actually represents a lot of waste. Is without Agile, with traditional project management in this sort of mode, sticking to their their um, competence, one person was doing the front end, one was doing the, the server side back end, one was creating the rendering engine. Um, <clears throat> and within about, within a few months, we, we definitely got to this stage and there was something like a, you know, a doubling of performance. You know, not that performance is the only thing that's important. So another thing that I would always do um, is to make it visible, another form of make it visible, and that is, for example, you, well, with pair programming, you can, you can stick a, a matrix on the wall, um, you can create it with post-its, perhaps with the names of the people horizontally, the names of the people vertically, and then ask every time somebody pairs with somebody else for, to put a sticky dot or a post-it or something like that at that location, and then that provides the, the data for the team to, to actually um, reflect on that at the retrospective and decide on the next step. So a few ideas. Now, what managers can do, of course, is to give permission. And uh, managers need to get, if, if they're in, that, in the mode of sort of thinking that they need to know how long did each individual engineering task take um, and who did that and, and measuring individual performance, then they need to rapidly get out of, out of that sort of mode. And that's, a, I think, an important, an important impediment that scrum masters need to grab and uh, use their full powers of persuasion, for example, storytelling, to help managers to understand that there's, a, there's another way. <coughs> so, it's not just for programming. It's also for other work at Deutsche Telekom, the um, a company called Interactive Media, which is in fact an advertising sales company. It, Deutsche Telekom owns a large portfolio of advertising space on portals, on buildings, and so on. Actually, the, the largest in Europe. And we did agile training and coaching for them, with them. And they took on board this idea of, of pair working. And they found that creating cross-functional teams, pair working in terms of how they actually sell and then provide service to their clients. Their clients are the advertising agencies in Madison Avenue, New York City. Um, that actually improved 
made it more fun to work and actually improved performance considerably. Cognitive diversity. In organizations generally, I think there's a, there, there's a culture, in most organizations, there's a culture of um, employing people who are similar to, or managers tend to hire people who are similar to themselves from a personality point of view. And actually, for high performance teams, we need a, a mixture of different people. People who fundamentally tick differently. Uh, now, you can overdo it. You can, if, you, if you have people over here and, and other people over here, um, for example, there's a, there's a personality, well, it's related to personality, it's, the, it's a scale which measures your, your natural innovation style called the Curtin Adapter Innovator Scale. There are people over here who are pure adapters. They're, they're capable of, uh, they're only capable of, of, of inventing new or of innovation based on tiny in, or in, little increments on, on, on or adaptations of what's already there. And there are other people over here who, who are only able to throw everything away and start again. Now, if you have those people in a team and not, the, not, the, uh, not people in the middle, then they will drive each other crazy. So you can overdo it. But we need to find a way in which, in which we can build teams with, with more diversity. And it's, it's a contentious topic because the, the tests like Myers-Briggs, which seems to have no scientific basis, uh, and other tests, um, most of the tests based on the, the work um, for, I think, I guess over 100 years now from Carl Jung, um, don't have much scientific basis behind them or not rigorous and are used to make decisions about what people are allowed to do, and that's not okay. But what, what I do um, quite often with teams is to use a very lightweight personality test that, um, in fact, I, I got to hear about from a, a scrum master at, at Google. She's a scrum master at one of the Google email team or Google mail teams. And if you have a team with, with trust, um, in, a, in the context of a retrospective where people um, would be interested in, in, in finding out more about their personality and how others see them, it's the sort of thing that you can, do, you can actually do within, a, within an agile team. And then the team can reflect on that and use that to, to look at how can we actually make sure that we're covering all the bases. <clears throat> The research that um, Scott Page shows in his, his great book, The Difference, um, shows very, very clearly that actually having top technical, the top technical skills in a team is not the most important thing. Having cognitive diversity is more important. So diverse teams continually, con consistently, not every time, of course, but consistently outperform um, teams that have that, have, that are diverse. Sorry, consistently outperform teams that have hand-picked specialists. <clears throat> so I, I think there's a, there's a dilemma here. As an, as an agilist, I believe fundamentally in, in, in a participatory approach to, to introducing agile f to, to teams, and, and I believe fundamentally in you know, treating people as adults um, the team decides, the scrum master doesn't decide, for example, how, an, how a scrum team, you know, what a scrum team does, the team decides. But uh, so, one spawn part of me says that organizations should actually decide who should be in what team based on, or the, the team members themselves should decide who, who should be in, in, in what team, in which team. So the idea is if, if you've got a, if you're transforming a business unit to agile um, and you've, you've got perhaps enough people for five or six agile teams. You'd gather, gather them all together in a, in a, in a room, um, explain the basis of, of the you know, cross-functional teams and, and so on, and then ask them to divide themselves up into teams. The problem is, though, I think, there is, there is a dilemma here that, that they will probably, in many cases, um, go for harmony rather than the necessary creative conflict that you can get by having the mix, a mixture of 
of teams. And I don't have a solution necessarily, ex ex except perhaps to, to, uh, to help them to understand, first of all, their, their personality types, which, as I said, is, is contentious. Has anybody got any uh, ideas on how do you decide who should be in what team? How do you, how could you, how do you, how do you maximize cognitive diversity in your teams? Linda? Yeah, I mean, I think, absolutely, and there's, there, so I think, I, as Linda just said, um, have more women is my understanding, and I think there was an article recently in the Harvard Business Review that showed very clearly that the key factor is actually more women. So diversity is one of the facts, one of the dimensions of diversity, I guess, but it's, of, it's a very, very important one. Any other comments? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. So you need you need skeptics and true believers. And I'm I'm reminded of um, Reminded of one of the fearless change patterns, of course, champion skeptic, which was always my, my favorite, my favorite, um, favorite pattern. Having somebody who's, who's prepared to, 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 to say, well, that can't work, to, to, to raise, to, to bring up the, the potential problems, the pitfalls in, in, a, in, a, in, an infam in, a, in a meeting, for example, or even in a team setting can, can be um, advantageous. Again, it can be overdone, I guess. So diversity is really, really important. The next one, intrinsic motivation. Um, now, of course, it's not just intrinsic motivation. Also, extrinsic motivation is important. But my assumption is that the things that people need to motivate them extrinsically, you know, the things from outside are fundamentally taken care of. You know, like they've got enough to drink and eat and that, they've, that, that money, is, money is not, they're not continuously thinking about money because they're being paid enough. And they're being paid enough in comparison to, to uh, people doing, doing similar jobs. So you know, um, different mo other mot theories of motivation are also important. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, equity theory, and so on is important. But the, I think that the motivational model that, that's really inspired me is, is self-determination theory. And I think this is where Dan Pink, in his book, Drive, The Surprising Truth About What mo Motivates Us, took a lot of his um, ideas from, um, is that self deter so autonomy in terms of you know, being the masters of our own destiny as a team, in particular, um, being not continually dependent on other people outside of the team to, do, to generate business value, to do the work. This is really crucial. Now, you get that through, through having a, a true cross-functional team, but then many organizations then break it by saying, well, okay, you've got to send your intermediate results up to some other organi organizational entity for approval. Now, for example, a lot of companies have a, have a design department, um, and in one particular case, so it's a, it's a true story based with the names protected to protect the innocent and the guilty, but there's a certain company has a, has a design department. Um, the design department thinks it's, the, well, they think they're really good. They think they're as good as Johnny Ive and uh, his group of people because they're not. Nobody's as good as them, I guess. And the creative directors insist on reviewing the, the product design not the technical design, but the product design of, of a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, um, applications. And first of all, this introduces a, a bottleneck. It delays progress. But also, there are great designers in the team. 
And of course, that is a, an injury to the autonomy of the team. This is what we mean by autonomy in this context. It's really important that not only are the skills in the team to do the job, but actually that you trust the people to do that job without having to continuously refer the, the intermediate results to others. <clears throat> obviously other examples in a, in a similar vein. Mastery, or as I think it's, it's called in self-determination theory, competence. So, you know, making sure that people have the have the, the, the right skills, having a good development path, but also awakening the, the joy of learning new things. You know, as knowledge workers, we need to treat, our, treat ourselves as, as craftspeople. And we need to be, you know, craftspeople are responsible for sharpening their own tools. My, um, one of my grandfathers in the, around 1880, he was, a, he was uh, doing his apprenticeship um, to be a carpenter and one of the first things he had to do was to make his own tools. I've inherited those tools and they're amazing. So amazing woodworking tools that, you know, well over 100 years later um, are still fantastic. Now, I'm not saying that every, every knowledge worker needs to create their own development environment or their own text editor or whatever it is, but they do need to take into, into their own hands some of the responsibility for, for improving those, those skills and the sorts of things that you can do as a scrum master, as a manager, or as a, another person um, in, in some sort of leadership role, are to do things like holding um, coding dojos inside your company, or holding hackathons. I think there's gonna be a, a talk from uh, Log Me In later on, on, uh, on how they've been using hackathons to, to help him to, to drive innovation. But it can actually help people to understand that, that, uh, <coughs> that they need to take some of the responsibility for improving their, tool, their, own, their skills um, into their own hands. In most cities of the world these days, there's a huge number of meetups. So people coming together, um, learning, learning new skills by, by taking part in coding dojos where they, they do pair programming in a, in, a, in a social environment with beer and pizza and fun and they program a, a hangman game or something like that. So as a scrum master, try to encourage your, make your, your team aware of these things. Maybe they're not even aware of that that's what great agile developers do, for example. And finally, purpose. Purpose, I think, is really important. We need, to, we need to believe in what we're doing. We need to, we need to be proud of what we're doing. Now, if, we, if we're a development team creating a heart pacemaker, it doesn't mean we have to be a, a potential customer. But we can still, you know, hopefully, we won't be a, a potential customer for that, a potential user. But we, we can still be proud of our, our, of our um, of our professional ethics, we can actually be, be proud of, the, of the, the, the high quality solutions that we're creating. But I think it goes further than that. It also goes, it, it's also important, for example, that as a scrum master, you coach your, your product owner to allow the team to have great ideas, to also have the team to propose um, features to be put into the product because they're creative people and they can they can actually, uh, they will very often have, have great ideas. So the, the company Immobilien Scout in Germany, it's one of, the, it's one of the, the, the company that has the leading property portal in Germany. Um, it's a real estate portal. They've built that into the sort of bill of rights for developers. So they've said that developers don't just develop, they also are involved in discovery. And I was, in, I was very inspired by uh, the, the product owner of a, of a, of, of a, a similar um, real estate portal in, in, in Budapest. And uh, she was telling, telling us in, in, in these, um, I think a product owner class that we held last year, that she allows an, a number of story points for each sprint that, where the team can decide what, what should actually be included in, in the product. I think that's, that's, uh, that's a great way to do it. 
Of course, as a product owner, you have to have a veto, re a veto sorry, almost went into German there. You have to have a, a right of veto on that because you, you're, you're responsible for the conceptual integrity of the product. But uh, try to make sure that we don't go back to the old Tayloristic idea of, of teams um, just have being, being the realizers, the people who have to do the doing and other people do the thinking. Another key factor for intrinsic motivation is flow. Um, <coughs> I probably need some help in saying his name, but I'm going to try it. Um, so the, the great Hungarian psychologist, Csik Szent Mihaly, <laughs> um, almost approximately right, hopefully. Um, He's, he, his discovery that, you know, that flow is, is really crucial, and I think there's an emerging, under, un, emerging understanding that flow is not just for individuals, it's also for teams. And that the key things that as, as leaders we can do are to have clear goals and then to give immediate feedback. Um, but also to have this balance between opportunity and capacity so that we're not continually, not just doing things um, that are easy for us. They need to be goals that are stretched. They need to be um, challenges, um, things that we, can, we, we are capable of achieving, but we have to actually put some effort into it. And of course, sustaining that is really challenging, but uh, important. OK, so we've covered, we've looked at some of the key factors. Just to wrap up some of them is a few ideas, um, easy things to try out. Um, first of all, create some stable team, create a stable team. Just one is good enough to start. You know, if you, if you have a culture within your organization of, of creating project specific teams and then when the project is, is finished, uh, dissolving the team, um, try just creating one team and see what happens. Make it stable and see what happens. <clears throat> Next thing is allow people, give permission to do pair working. Tell stories about, about what other teams did with pair programming or other types of pair working and make sure as managers, if, if, if make sure your managers or if you're a manager yourself that you give permission to do that. Again, just make it an experiment, try it out, see what happens. And finally, Try building in cognitive diversity. Now, I think your reflective managers, people, often you know, the people responsible for making hiring decisions about or choosing who will be in what team, so staffing teams, are the, are the line managers or functional managers of, 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 of the workers. But try, when you're creating stable teams, try to use your instinct to staff them with people who have the right sort of cognitive diversity, so a diverse set of, of uh, different types of personality. So I think those are three things that are quite easy to try. Um, you don't have to have a revolution. You can actually do it for one team or a few teams and then see what happens. Thank you very much. Any, do we have any time for questions? Yeah, okay. Questions, comments, or anything else? Are there any factors, important factors for high performance that, that I've missed? So what are the other things that can block trust and how to overcome them? Well, I'm not an expert on that, and, um, but I have a friend who is an expert, and I would refer you to, to him, so Olaf Levitz, um, all based in Germany, and he's, he's, as nickname, he calls himself the trust artist. I think his website is trust, trustartist.com, and he's got some ideas on, on how to do that. And in fact, we're, I'm looking at working together with him at this client I was talking about earlier where they've got a trust problem. 
Now they have a, one thing that they do is they, they, they or he, that he does all together with a, um, a, a colleague, um, is that they have a, they, they run a workshop, which I think is called Temenos, um, where they tell stories to each other and go right back into childhood about, about what happened. And it needs, of course, a very carefully, a very carefully constructed safe environment to do that type of thing. Um, so as, a, as an amateur in that, in that particular thing, I wouldn't do it on my own. It needs professional help. Any other, has anybody got any ideas on how to build trust? I remember actually one thing from your talk from years ago, Linda, is that, it stuck with me, is that you don't need to like the people that you're working with, but you need to trust them. Great, thank you. So uh, Jim McCarthy, and I think they, his his um, his big project over the last year, few years has been the core protocols. Yes. Is that? Yep. Yep. Software for your head. Software for your head. Great. <laughs> and maybe slightly in the, in a sort of similar, slightly similar vein is the the uh, retrospective prime directive, which I I, th I think is a is a really important way of helping a team to get into a, into a safer space in which they can talk about difficult problems. Um, the prime directive, um, forgive me if I misquote it slightly, but we understand and we truly believe that everybody did the best they could um, in the context of the situation at hand, their skills and, and, and abilities. Now, even if we know, if, even if we think we know who was to blame for the mess that we got ourselves into, for example, if it was a mess. Um, if we say that, we, if we actually go through the ritual of, of reading that to, to ourselves, if the scrum master or the other, other retrospective facilitator um, presents that, writes that neatly on a flip chart and helps people to, or reminds people of that at the start of a retrospective, we can actually trick our, trick our brains into getting closer to truly believing it and making it a slightly safer space in which to talk about um, problems of, of trust, for example. But a um, very good point that trust is a, is, is a two-way thing. It's not just between management and team. It's not just that the management needs to trust the team and even that the, the team members need to trust each other. The team needs to trust management. 
as well. I, I, I totally agree with you. Balancing opportunity and, and uh, challenge. Um, it's about having you know, tasks which are at least having some tasks which are not too easy, um, so where we actually have to stretch ourselves a little bit. So I think, and you know, I do see this happen with Agile teams after they've been together for a, quite a long time, you know, maybe 20 sprints or whatever, then it becomes a little bit too much of a routine. And I think um, by enabling the team, for example, to choose some of the product backlog items if we're using Scrum um, themselves within limits can, can help. Yeah, so not actually out of their comfort zone, but um, you know, something that where they have to actually learn new technologies, learn new, new things. Um, so not pushing them, because you know, pushing is always counterproductive, I think, but creating an environment in which they're able to, 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 to actually embrace new challenges is, is, is very important there. I think, is there, I think there's a talk on flow later and uh, from, from Daniel, Daniel Collier, as far as I remember, I saw, saw that in the program, so maybe that would um, be something to look at. Time for self-reflection. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Yep. So, I guess can we have one more question, and then I guess we're out. We're out of time. So, yep. or one. Well, great, great thing, great question. I mean, and I'd like to really go back to an, another example outside design and then use that as an example, maybe a, a pattern that one can reuse. Once upon a time, there was a company with a, with a, with a team of, of database experts who were the only people who were allowed to, to make changes to the, the, the mission critical data warehouse in the company, but almost every team, almost every development team, almost every iteration or sprint needed to make changes to the team, to, the, to that database, and had the capability to do that. You know, they, they had some basic knowledge, at least, about, about that. So, of course, that was a, a bottleneck in terms of, you know, that was a, a very much an example of, of waste um, in terms of handing over, the, handing over work from one team to another, but also, and, and it was a bottleneck, but also it was an injury to the autonomy of the team. Now, what we did was to, um, took, took several months to persuade people to give this a try. This team was trans transformed into a team of database coaches um, who were then embedded with development teams for one or two sprints and um, had the job of helping bring the team up, the level of the team up. If you had enough database experts, you just embed one in every team and then your problem would be solved. And they're still allowed to talk to each other as database experts through a, a community of practice or as it's called at Spotify, for example, a chapter or a guild, depending on the, the level. And um, then you can, then, then things can work out very well. But then in, in addition, in, in fact, in this particular case, there weren't enough people um, to embed them in every team that we, we um, helped them to um, have a new mission, and that was to be a database coach. They were embedded within the teams for one or two sprints. They brought the levels of the teams up, and then they retained their existence as a their identity as a team, and they were then available as, as consultants. So when teams had problems with the database, so performance pro problems, they could actually hire those, that, that team of consultants to, to help um, do some troubleshooting. So I, I, would put, I would humbly suggest that, that that could be a model for a design team. Um, in the particular company, I was, sorry? So I, th 
I might, might, absolutely, and I think there's a, what we need is designers direct UX people in every Agile team. You know, there's, a, there's a great book, um, a book that's really inspired me, Lean UX, um, and basically the two guys who wrote it tried every possible combination. The only thing that really worked is having de designers directly in the teams, or they got the best results. And that, of course, doesn't mean that the designers in, in, in multiple teams aren't allowed to talk to each other. Of course, they are allowed to talk to each other, and they can actually achieve alignment um, through that means. Now, my understanding, I don't know much about the details, but quite a lot of the, the Google material design was actually achieved through that sort of emergent approach in direct contrast to, to the Apple approach, which was much more of a, a design team creating a, from the top a design and then uh, pushing that down. And if there's still people with the title creative directors, you can invite them to come to sprint review meetings, of course, and give their feedback there. So I guess our time is up. Thank you very much. Um, please don't forget to write your post-its and stick them to the wall um, at the back, um, your feedback post-its. Thank you very much. And if anybody has got any other questions about some of the things that I've talked about, I'm going to be here for the next uh, day and a half, and it'd be great to talk to you. Thank you.